بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful سبحان الله الحمد لله ولا اله الا الله الله اكبر سبحان الله الحمد لله ولا اله الا الله الله اكبر سبحان الله الحمد لله ولا اله الا الله الله اكبر سبحان الله الحمد لله ولا اله الا الله الله اكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا اله الا الله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا وحبيبنا وقدوتنا وإمامنا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد Always we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on every condition we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He is the creator, nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector, curer The one who is in absolute control of every aspect of existence The one who really has bestowed us with much, much goodness and the one who really will deliver us from all evil and the one whom at the same time will bless us in every way still and on the day of Qiyamah we ask him through his mercy to grant us paradise. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all his companions and to bless every single one of us to grant us goodness and to grant goodness to those whom we have lost in the form of children or spouses or in the form of family members, loved ones. May Allah bless them. May he make them a means of our entry into paradise through the sabr and the patience that we have had to go through that perhaps others have not had to endure. My beloved brothers and sisters, indeed it is an honor to be here to share a few moments of this evening with you. I would not be exaggerating if I were to tell you that I have a very hectic schedule but at the same time I am honored to have been permitted to make the time to see faces in front of me of those whom Allah loves and I have no doubt about that. The reason I say this is because this evening we are speaking to people who have lost loved ones and for myself what I'd like to do or what I'd like to achieve by this evening is the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for myself and at the same time a reminder for myself, a lesson for myself as well as a reminder for yourselves, an arm of support for yourself and at the same time reminders from the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which would direct you and at the same time remind you what exactly has happened and why it has happened. So I'd like to commence by telling you that every one of us who is here has been created for a purpose. Do you know the purpose? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created mankind and jinn kind except that they may worship me. One might ask, well, he had the angels who were worshipping him. Why then did he have to create us? We are different. We have a choice. We have been given the ability to sin, the ability to obey, and the brain to understand the difference between the two. And at the same time, Allah is testing us which way we actually move. And remember, everything you have belongs to Allah. And everything I have belongs to Allah. We are only making use of it for a short period of time that we are here. The clothes you are wearing, the clothes I am wearing, they're not mine as such. We might say, oh, they belong to me because I paid for them or I own them. But in reality, there is an owner above me who is Allah. 
When I die, they're not going to take my wardrobe and put it into the grave. No. When I die, whatever I leave behind now belongs to whom Allah decides it will belong to. To the degree that I don't even have a say, except very limited. You know the laws of inheritance. It's Allah. He decides. This is why he says, Your fathers or your children, you don't know which of them will benefit you more. Which of them will be closer to you in benefit? This is a very broad verse, which means also you don't know who's going to die first and who will inherit from the other. Sometimes parents inherit from their children and sometimes children inherit from their parents. That's Allah's plan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in absolute control. He has made us in order for us to worship him. And he says, if you read Surah Al-Mu'minun, Qad Aflah Al-Mu'minun, at the bottom of the first page, you will find a verse, subhanallah, where Allah tells you how he created you. I'm sure it's a beautiful verse. You may have heard it many times. He makes mention of the different stages of the embryo and the stages of the creation of man. And then man, lo and behold, is born. Then Allah says, once you're born, what's the next stage? He tells you, then you prepare for death. You're going to die after that. After that, on the day of Qiyamah, you are resurrected. So he is telling you, there is life, there is death, then there is an everlasting life with no more death. Subhanallah. Moments ago, I had a program on CII and I made mention of an interesting point. We all want Jannah, but no one wants to die. I want paradise. Don't you want paradise? Who wants paradise? All of us. Who wants to die now? No one. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us good health and may he make us understand why we are here. So in a nutshell, if I were to tell you that life is preparation for death, that's another way of wording it. I'm here to prepare for the day I'm going to meet my Rabb, Allah. That's why I'm here. I lose focus because the environment around me is hostile. There is so much glamour and glitter all around me. And I see the beautiful vehicles and the lovely homes and the different sexes of the world. And I see the animals and the gardens. And I start thinking this is lush and plush. And I start working towards it, not realizing ultimately I might make use of it. I might enjoy the scenery and so on. But I need to prepare for the day that I'm going to die in a way that I have a palace in the life after death and I can be united with the loved ones that perhaps may have passed on before me or may pass on after me whom I have been with in this world and I have come to know because of the link Allah placed your child how was your child linked to you your loved one it was by the choice of Allah Allah chose for you to mix with the child for a while to become fond of the child and at the same time he said I will take that child away Allahu Akbar one might say but why did you do that ya Allah why did you do that I can give you a quick answer he knew it was best for you in many ways. I can mention a few ways right now. Best for you because he is giving you an opportunity to engage in an act of worship that he has not chosen but a few to engage in. What is that? Sabr. Sabr is of different categories. And Allah says, Innama yuwaffa sabirun ajrahum 
Allah recompenses those who were patient and forbearant without a limit. No limits. So you want to know what's your reward? You won't know. You just need to try. That's all. Try doing what? Bearing patience upon what Allah has chosen for you. So one, Allah gives you an opportunity to engage in an act of worship which draws you closer to Him. Opportunity that others have not had. And Allah says in the Quran, Inna Allah I'm sure you know that verse. Allah is with those who bear patience. Which means He has given you an opportunity to get closer to him and he get closer to you subhanallah and at the same time allah knows it was best for you we spoke about the one angle that you are engaged in a different act of worship but on top of that allah knows it was best for you and for the child to go at that age where the child is sinless spotless pure innocent as we would say totally innocent their book of records have not yet been opened or the books of record have not yet been opened and the child is gone yeah Allah you took my child away Allah says didn't I leave you with fond memories of the child you say yes you did didn't I leave you with the highest level of love for that loved one and it was not a hated one you say yes Allah says I know it's better for you if that child had to grow you don't know what would have happened nor do I you don't know so I did you a favor by taking the child away in a condition or the loved one away in a condition where you still love them dearly perhaps the highest degree of love of this world and Allah says I took them away so now you always smile when you think of them Ya Allah you make a good dua and yet the Quran in Surah Al-Kahf speaks about how there was a child Musa alayhi salam was walking with Al-Khidr it's in the Quran I'm sure you have read it and suddenly they passed a young lad and Al-Khidr executed him have you come across that Al-Khidr executed him so Musa alayhi salatu was salam says how could you kill someone without any reason? There was no reason for you to do this. And Al-Khidr says, Allah has given me knowledge that he did not give you. Keep quiet. And you know, the story continues until he explained why. He says, he says, as for that child who we executed, his parents were pious, good parents. They were believers. And we knew that if he had grown up, two things would have come in him. What? Kufr and Turyan. Imagine a renege, a renegade, a person who turns away to disbelief. What pain would there be in the heart of the parents? Today, if someone said, hey, that person's child is, astaghfirullah, gay. Or this person's child has left Islam, they've become satanistic. Wouldn't it pain the parent, to say the least? Pain. So kufr and tughyan means sin. One who transgresses openly. Taghi, a person who is sinful. So because of that, Allah says, when he was executed, he would be replaced with others who would not be like that. Now if you analyze that, we learn something from it. What do we learn? The depth of Allah's knowledge. Allah knows the past tense, right? Allah knows the present tense. And Allah knows what is going to happen in the future. But His knowledge does not stop there. He knows what is not going to happen in the future. If it were to happen, how it would have happened. That's something amazing. Did you hear what I said? What is not going to happen in the future? If I'm going to die at 70, had I lived up to 80, he would know my condition. And yet he knows I'm not going to live up to 80. Subhanallah. 
But he knows, was I given life what I would have done? He already knows it. Where do we get evidence for this from? There's the verse. The child was never going to grow up because the child passed away innocent, beautiful age. Gone. Parents are crying and saying, our beautiful child. Allah says, that's my gift to you. I took the child away beautifully. And Allah says in those verses, and I believe these verses are a lesson for all of us to say, we're not saying our child was going to be bad. No, but we're saying this is the best condition. Allah chose it for you. Allah chose it. And the verse here says, those who, who lost that child, had they had the child for longer than they did, he would have caused suffering to them because of his disbelief and his sin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. Are you following where I'm getting? To so say Allah knows why he did it. And Allah says, look, I took a blessed child. At least you have fond memories. You know, I'm sure you have had people who have uh, children who are totally disobedient to the degree that the parents say, I just wish this guy could die. I, I'm sure you've heard statements like those, especially living in an environment which is quite hostile, like the one we are in. And they might not mean it, but we've lost people whom we've never ever even smelt that direction of a statement. Not even. To us, the most dear thing we looked forward to every day. It was our life sometimes. Allah says, hang on, I know what's better for you. This is why those who don't have children at all, Allah knows perhaps they would not be able to go through the death of a child at an early age or at a certain age. So Allah says, I just won't give him to you in the first place. Because perhaps they might lose their Iman in the process. And because we are known to be stronger by Allah, Allah tests you more and more. And I want to prove to you the hadith says, Inna Allah idha ahabba abdan ibtalahu. When Allah loves his slave or his worshiper, that is when he tests him with big tests. Because you need a bigger degree. You need a qualification. I need a qualification to enter paradise, isn't it? So let me now show you in this world, you have a matrix certificate. Okay, if you want to go into an accounting firm, what will happen? They're going to tell you, okay, you can come in, perhaps you can start off low down articles a few years, then you still got to work hard, you got to work your way up and so on. But if you are already a CA with your degree and you walk into an accounting firm, they may offer you partnership. Do you agree? They may say you work for two, three years, then we offer you some sort of an offer. You already start on a high pedestal because you have such a high qualification. What made you have a high qualification? Have you asked yourself? The test was bigger, wasn't it? Very big test. I mean, a matric and compare it to the final qualifying exam. Two different things. Total different ball game. That's what happens to us. Total different ball game. Allah loves you. So he says, hang on, some people have only been tested, they have a matric certificate. For you, I want you to get that FQE, final qualifying examination. When I give it to you, if you pass it, I won't look at your other deeds, you can go into paradise. Perhaps, may Allah do that to us. When he loves you, sometimes our salah, see different people are driven to paradise through different deeds some people through their salah some people through their zakah some people through a combination of so many deeds some people might be weak maybe they don't have so many different deeds so allah says hang on i want to give you paradise i take your child away he is already going to be in paradise because his books have not yet opened his sim card is not yet activated but it's there subhanallah so he has no bill you know they can't bill you for a sim card that's not activated See, he's going to be there, but we want you to be with him. That's why we are going to take him away early. If you bear patience, that alone will be enough for us to recompense you without hisab. That's the word used in the Quran. No limit, nothing, no account. So here you are seated in front of me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Remember the loved ones you've lost, you will be united with them by the will of Allah. The condition is bare sabr. Thank Allah upon all conditions. 
Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. Why shouldn't we praise Allah upon all conditions? What is the ultimate thing? If I, if I were to ask, and I have asked questions in the past, what's the worst thing that could happen to you right now? You'd say, suffer a heart attack. It's the worst thing. I think if you were to ask me, maybe I might say the same thing. What's the worst thing that could happen to anyone right now? Heart attack and everyone's, oh, that might just be the best thing that happened to you because paradise is waiting for you. If you had lived another day, you may have committed a sin that might have compromised your paradise. So then Allah knows when you should go. Subhanallah. This is why the hadith says something amazing. Tuhfatul mu'mini al mawtu. Tuhfa means a gift. A gift of a true believer is death. People don't understand it until you see death in you at close range then you understand they've gone where did they go do you think they just lost that's it they're not lost they've actually now found reality and we're about to get there how do you get there by dying you want to meet your children your lost ones meaning your your loved ones who have passed on we shouldn't be using the word lost anyway then when you die you will meet them when you go to paradise, you will see them. So let's do deeds that will get us into paradise. And we make dua to Allah to forgive our shortcomings and to help us through the loss. Because to cry is natural. To miss someone is normal. It's human nature. Allah's kept it in your nature. But at the same time, to be a person who can sit Thanking Allah through difficulty that, Ya Allah, this is what you've done. I thank you for whatever you have done. I praise you upon all conditions. Another hadith says there is a special entry that will be granted firstly to those on the day of Qiyamah, whom whilst they were in the dunya, they used to thank Allah upon all conditions. A caller will call out, Aina alladheena kanu yahmadoon Allah fi kulli hal. Where are those who used to thank Allah, praise Allah? Hamd means praise. Praise Allah on all conditions. Goodness, praise Allah. Something you consider loss, praise Allah. When you have a business, suddenly it's burnt down. It's burnt down. Allah protect us. We look at it as a loss or a profit. What do we look at it as? A loss. That is a material loss but it's spiritual gain. Why? Now you come to the salah early, ya Allah. So Allah says, my worshiper, two million went, but you know that raising of your hands is worth 10 million. Subhanallah. And Allah says, my worshiper, you call out to me. I said it on the radio a few minutes ago. My worshiper, you make dua to me for something I put in your heart to want. You know, sometimes, you want something, you say, Ya Allah, grant me this, Ya Allah, grant me this, Ya Allah, grant me this. Allah put it in your heart to want it and to make dua to Him, to ask for it. And Allah knows He's not going to give it to you in the dunya. He'll give it to you some other time or something else will happen. What happened? Allah says, my worshiper, I'm never, I'm never going to give this to you because of how detrimental it is for you. <coughs> it is so detrimental for you that I cannot give it to you, but... I will make you keep on asking me for it so that you can remain so close to me. Because had you had it, you might distance yourself from me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Give you an example of wealth. A poor man, every day he's in the masjid. Ya Allah, grant me sustenance. Ya Allah, I need to buy the merk. I need to live in a lovely home. Ya Allah, I want to buy a big house. Ya Allah, I need this. And inshallah, I will build a masjid and I will do this and I will that. Ya Allah, I need wealth. And one year passes, two years, ten years years past 15 years past nothing has happened and he's still making dua and he's in the masjid and he's he's barely making a living but he doesn't have extra wealth so he didn't sin meaning the minute he gets that money huge amount it becomes a bigger test sometimes if he gets it overnight he might just rush to the nightclub develop five or six girlfriends because now he's got the money he might develop that 
He might, for example, uh, go into the casinos, go into the clubs. He might uh, start flying here and there across the globe, leaving his salah. Now his dua is accepted. So what's the point of going to the masjid and asking for the same thing? So Allah says, my worshiper, because I love you, I will keep you here. Because I know had I given you what you want, perhaps you may then forget about me. And this is in the Quran in many places. وَإِذَا أَنْعَمْنَا عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ أَعْرَضَ وَنَآ بِجَانِبِهِ وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ فَذُو دُعَاءٍ عَرِيضٍ Allah says, when we bestow man with everything he wants, he turns away. He turns onto his side. He forgets us like we didn't even exist. And when we pushing a little bit of calamity in his direction, he comes with the broadest of du'as, which is a better condition spiritually. Let's be honest. So when Allah loves you, he tests you. Not to say we were not already Allah's and not to say we were so disobedient. No, but he wants to grant you Jannah through your sabr and through just starting to think of reality. Every one of you have thought far deeper than the one who hasn't been through the test you've been through because you have had the time to think, to ponder. You now miss your loved one, but they were here. They could have been here. I have a very close friend of mine whose son, 19 years old, Allah grant him Jannah, was shot dead with a bullet in his head in front of his father whilst his eyes were fixed to his father saying, Dad, what should I do? Father says, first time I didn't have an answer for my son. They were in a vehicle. The thugs came in, KwaZulu Natal. They shot him dead, cold blood. They couldn't steal the motor vehicle because someone was behind them. That's all they did and they went away. And it was a huge death. Imagine the type of difficulty, 19 years old. And I want to tell you something. All of you will bear witness to this. When you have lost a child in early age, there has to have been some unique qualities of that child. I can tell you that without a doubt. I know I haven't had one exception, not even one. Something that is so different. This child was something else. May Allah grant them Jannah, grant us Jannah. That is why Allah is showing you that look, it's in my hands. I'll grant you even better. The same child in a better condition. Where are they? They're waiting for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the people of paradise. He says, Those children will be rotating, serving them and being around them in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would cool the eyes of those whose children they were. The children. Innocent children. In another verse, Allah says, lahum. That's even a more clear verse. Ghilman means their children, their own children will be there, which means waiting for them. In a narration, the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever's lost a child, that child will intercede on behalf of the parents to say, Oh Allah, you did not give them an opportunity to play with me whilst I was young. Ya Allah, grant them paradise. I will be here, Ya Allah. And I would like them to enter paradise, subhanallah. For as long as you have had that sabr, you will enter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us entry into Jannah. So we should not look at it as an outright loss. It is a temporary loss, a loss of this world. The Prophet ﷺ, for your information, who was he? When I came and I started here, I told you, Allah loves you. Didn't I say that? Let me tell you why I said that. What makes me so sure? Obviously, I cannot guarantee that, but I can tell you that you have a much bigger opportunity than others. Let me tell you, because the most beloved unto Allah was whom? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What happened to him? Yes, tell me. What? Sorry, three sons. Anyone wants to say anything else? Sorry? 
Yes. Anyone wants to say anything else? Can I word it in a way that will shock you? He lost all his children besides one. All of them. All of them. Infancy and adulthood. Daughters and sons. Everybody gone. Besides one. Who passed away very soon after he passed away. That was Fatima. Radiallahu anha. The rest of them, Ruqayya, Um Kulthum, Tayyib, Tahir, everyone gone. Subhanallah, Ibrahim, everyone gone, one after the other. Not only that, he lost his own father before he was even born. Born an orphan. Why? Why? He was the most loved to Allah, the best of creation. Why? Why did he go through that? For Allah to show me and you, look, it's your link with Allah. As for the rest, you will get to them, no problem. But your being with them in this dunya does not really depict much in terms of the link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you surrender to Allah's law, that is what brings you closer to Allah. And that is what makes you most love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So nobody can say it's unfair what happened to me. If there was anyone who had to utter that, it would have been Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it is forbidden to utter those words. That is why he did not say them. He had his son in his hand. Ibrahim. And some of the narrations say, and I can tell you what, this is something that I've learned from. They say when the children were young, they used to send them to the Badia, out to the villages in order to breathe fresh air and in order to learn and in order to grow up in that healthy environment and so on. So he sent Ibrahim somewhere. The husband of the home was a blacksmith. And he used to blow into the ore and it used to cause a lot of smoke. And so Ibrahim alayhi salam or we call him Ibrahim ibn Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He developed a respiratory disease, sickness and illness whereby he couldn't breathe properly. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was called and when he came, نَفْسُهُ تُقَعْقِعُ كَأَنَّهَا فِي شَنٍ فَفَاضَتْ عَيْنَا It's difficult to describe. The Prophet ﷺ had his son in his hands, suffering to breathe, passed away in that condition. And his eyes became filled with tears. ﷺ. And the Sahaba عنهم, asking a question. You are crying, O Messenger? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because obviously he was the one giving advice and giving the courage and so on and today their tears he says innama hiya rahmatun ja'alaha Allahu fi ibadihi ruhama this is mercy the mercy tears of mercy that Allah has given those who are merciful we're not crying because we question the decree of Allah inna lillahi ma akhadha wa lahu ma a'ata for Allah belongs what he took away and what he gave in the first place was also his. Subhanallah. So that was the loss of Ibrahim. And the Prophet ﷺ cried and he made dua to Allah. And the Sahaba عنهم, learned from it. And yet he was the best of creation. Allah loved him undoubtedly more than entire creation. That's what we believe. We call him Habibullah, don't we? Which means the loved of Allah. So don't you feel honored that Allah has chosen you amongst others to go through a portion of what his most beloved went through. This is why I want to add something else. I want to add something else. I said moments ago that the child would have had unique qualities, something different, something that you can say this child was actually unique. I want to tell you something. I have noticed the parents of such children also have unique qualities. Subhanallah. I have noticed that. Pick them up. See their faces. We are looking at you today. Look at the way they carry themselves. See. They have some unique qualities and Allah loves them to the degree that he ensures that they tread the path in a way that they will also, by the will of Allah, get to Jannah. I told you the condition is just sabr, but it's an opportunity. 
It's like someone telling you, here's the exam, here's the answers. Pass it. Allahu Akbar. Here's the examination, here's the answers. We would be foolish if we say, no, I don't want to sit it. You have to, come on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on all of us. So the spirit, or should I say the soul, doesn't die. Remember one thing. I said right at the beginning that we are alive and we worded it several different ways. One of the things I said is to prepare for the day we die. You remember I said that moments ago? Let me tell you. All the things we have, we said they belong to Allah. Did you ever think and ponder for a moment that nothing that we really love is from outside the earth? Nothing in terms of material items. Nothing is from outside the earth, including our children and us. We love ourselves. Allah says, you are from dust. Where is it from? The earth. You were not created from dust, from Pluto or Mars or Venus, from the earth, this earth. So this body of mine is just temporary. When I die, I'll be resurrected in a different body. Perfect one. Subhanallah. What do you like? I always say, ask the people, what do you like? Mobile phones? Well, see, the plastic comes from the earth. They've made it. What else? The glass, sand, which is actually temperature and pressure. Put up glass. Your clothing, cotton, grown. Leather, the cow. Cow from the earth. What else? Motor vehicle, the tin, mined. What else? Gold mined from under the ground. What do you want? Silver mined from under the ground. Oil, petrol taken out from there. What else? Say anything. It will not be from anywhere but the earth. So Allah says, man, your mind is such that you only know how much we want you to know. And you think that's everything. Take a look around you, mashallah, whatever you have, the fish, the fish tank, the, the walls, the lights, the, everything else, the juice, whatever it is, where is it from? The earth. The fruit, where is it from? The earth. Honey, where is it from? The earth. Mashallah. Have you ever thought? We don't even know what lies beyond this earth. We don't even know. We cannot at this moment benefit from anything outside. In fact, if we go there, we won't even be able to breathe unless we take a tank from here. Oxygen, where do you get it? Earth's atmosphere. Now, what more do you want? So Allah says, man, it's just this earth. You have it. You don't even know what paradise is all about. This is why when people say, Ya Allah, if I don't have a Lamborghini here, give it to me in paradise. I tell them, no, don't say that. <laughs> You'll have the worst thing there. It's the only the thing you have here, there is going to be something from the earth. Everyone else will have something else. So say, Ya Allah, grant me Jannah. And at the same time, my beloved brothers and sisters, really, those who've lost spouses, those who've lost parents, those who've lost children, those who've lost siblings, remember, Allah loves you. We have not lost them in every sense of the word, but we miss them for a period of time because I am going there. And so are you. I have to. It's just a matter of time. I've given an example in the past to say, we all have a boarding pass. Every one of us has a boarding pass with your gate number and your boarding time written. Destination unknown. Allahu Akbar. But what's going to happen? We all going to the same place. We just don't know when we're going to board. It's like people go for Hajj. What happens? Some have already gone, isn't it? There's some go last minute, but they're all going to make the Hajj. Agreed? Five days, they'll all be there. They'll meet up if they have to. Brother, when are you going? He says, I'm going on the 27th. When are you going? Oh, I'm only going next month. Hey, he, I will make the Hajj, don't worry. So similarly, we all have the boarding pass. Some will go on the 27th, some will go on the 5th, some will go on another date. And we're all going somewhere where we will meet up again. And this is why we need to understand that Allah's plan is great, so great, that our minds sometimes do not comprehend the plan of Allah. So we need a reminder to say, my beloved brothers and sisters, remember whatever Allah does is the best, the best ever. 
It could not have been better. With our small minds, we think it's, it could have been better. Allah says, no, my worshiper, no. Like I told you moments ago, those who don't have children, sometimes they'll come and they'll weep and they'll make dua and they'll say this. Wallahi, that's good in a way. In a way, they keep on making dua, keeps them closer to Allah, so on and, so, and they continue. So they are closer to Allah and Allah did not give them a child who perhaps may have been disobedient as we learned from Surah Al-Kahf. May have been. Only Allah knows. But Allah says, no, we want you to have goodness in this world by not having a disobedient child. We want you to have goodness in the Akhirah by giving you an opportunity of sabr. And we want to unite you with your child by taking the child away in the period of innocence. So that means the child is definitely waiting for us. Now I want to tell you something else. Sometimes a person might have sins. Now you know we, when a person has sins, we make tawbah, which is repentance, and Allah forgives us by the will of Allah. Tawbah has four main conditions to admit your sin, to regret it, to ask for forgiveness, and to promise not to do it again. Those are four main conditions. To admit, to regret, to ask for forgiveness, to promise not to do it again. These are four main conditions. If you have met those conditions, the sin is wiped out completely. But sometimes if a person dies without having engaged in tawbah and they were believers, what will happen? They, will, they may go into Jannah with the mercy of Allah. He has the, the power to do that. He says, don't worry, there's one deed of yours I really loved, so I don't want to look at anything else. Carry on. That, that's there. It is spoken about in the hadith of Rasulullah that a woman entered Jannah due to her compassionate feelings towards a thirsty dog. You've heard that. That was one deed. So she was told going to Jannah. That everything else, by the way, I just like this thing here. Now don't you think what you've been through is far more valuable than being compassionate towards a thirsty dog? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Have hope. Allah is promising you so much. Imagine if someone says, look brother, you know, some weird example came to my mind right now, but let me say it. <laughs> go to jail for three years and I give you three big buildings in the middle of Cape Town. <laughs> I think I would go. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. I'd start a little madrasa in the jail, perhaps teach a few people in the meantime. Already my mind is working, you see? Why? Because I'm coming out to three buildings in the middle of town. Allah is telling you, go through a little bit of difficulty for 20 years of missing your child. And after 20 years, you are going to be united with your child anyway. And after that, you are going to get paradise anyway. Are you prepared to take that? Subhanallah. Subhanallah. You prepared to take that? Allah says, I give you paradise. I give you everything. It's just a matter, a waiting period. Subhanallah. People are jailed and get nothing in return. Allah is saying, this is not even jail. I mean, that's my example. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you are having an opportunity where just the sabr itself can be a deed that will just land you to Jannah. Whatever you've done, Allah won't, may not look at it. May, through His mercy. Then the point I was making is, if he decides to punish us, may he not do that to us, but if he decides to punish any one of us, will we be in Jahannam or in hellfire forever and ever when we have said the Shahada? The answer is no. You go there to serve your sentence. When your sentence is served, you are out. And when you go out, what happens? You'll still be united with your loved ones. So I can use the term hook or crook. You're going to meet them. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Even if you're going via, via, you know, you're still going to get there. A person who catches a direct flight into Medina, get there, how many hours earlier? Two, three, perhaps. Those who came via Dubai, via Ethiopia, via uh, Egypt, you know, they might have ordeals that they may have gone through to explain. They only came two hours after you, three hours. And maybe when they landed, the immigration officials were efficient. Perhaps, and those who came with a direct flight, perhaps the immigration officials were not efficient. So it took them longer there. Why I'm saying this is because we are all going to go into Jannah when we will meet up with our loved ones. Some of us will go early, some of us will go late, a year later, 20 years later, whatever. But we have to go. None of us can say, I'm not going. You could go tomorrow, the following day. My purpose in life is to live the span that was chosen for me by Allah. I don't choose how long I'm going to live. You know, I have, due to lack of sleep, a condition where 
Perhaps I feel, I don't know, maybe the doctors might not feel that, that I can drop any time. Now I'm opening my personal issue. <laughs> so what that does to me is it keeps me on check. This morning I left home, everything that had to be done was recited once again at home. If, if anything happens to me, this, 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 but don't say that. I have to say it in case it happens, but I've now said it 200 times. Wow, I think it's healthy. It's not abnormal to think of death. It's very healthy. The hadith says, increase the remembrance of that thing which is the destroyer of all false desires. What destroys your false desire? Person wants to sin. Then he thinks, hey, what if I die in the company of that prostitute? Astaghfirullah. Then what happens? I'm not going there. So why? Because he thought of death. If he didn't think of death, he would probably have gone. Allah safeguard us. So none of us have decided when we should go. Allah decides. But when he loves you, he sometimes makes you think you're going to go. Why? Because now you're ready for it. Not ready. No one will actually ever be ready because who wants to die? But at the same time, we would be a little bit more prepared to say, look, my kafan is there. My will is there. My spouse and family have been told what to do, what maybe, what not to do. They might go before you. This is it. So we have to go. What have you done to prepare for the day you are going to die? A lot of us, the only deed we have is the sabr upon someone who was taken away before us. One, two, three or more. Allahu Akbar. And we can say, Ya Allah, I don't have too many deeds, but Ya Allah, when you took my child away, it was quite difficult for me, but I was very, very patient. And I realized and understood that your decree is final. And I know you take better care of my child than I ever would have. And in fact, it's your child. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. If you look at it carefully, Allah chose me and you to be created through parents. But the Creator is Allah. If He wanted, He wouldn't have kept parents. So some of the scholars explain why they are parents. In order for people to help one another. Allahu Akbar. Have you thought of that? Your child is 20 years old. You try to set them up. You try to help them. Imagine if we didn't actually have children. All of us grew like trees and everyone was there. Even trees are related because you have the seed of this tree and so on and so forth. But imagine if we all were like Adam alayhi salam. I think we would be fighting like cats and dogs because no one's there to stand up for anybody. No one. So Allah says, I am the creator. I don't need you to have created the child. But I made it so that you can understand my whole plan. And you can support, you can look after. The child passed away. Who buried the child? Who took responsibility of the child? You, because I gave you the child. If I wanted, I could have given it to someone else. If I wanted, I could have had the child without involvement of parents, so to speak, in my system and my plan. That's Allah. He does what he wants, but he chose parents. And at the same time, we busy thinking, my child, my child, correct? Because for purposes of this world, they are my children. Allah has used lineage and he will call them by your name on the day of Qiyamah. That's the lineage. Allah honored us with that. But at the same time, he says, hang on, I am the giver of life and I take it. That life is the temporary life of this world. But once you die, you now enter life that has no death. It's like people say the definition of death is the end of life. And the Muslims say the definition of death is the beginning of the eternal life. Subhanallah, beginning of the eternal life. So from being alive to being more alive. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. We are going, prepare for the day. You know, I may go as I walk out, I may go right now. You may go, anyone might go. I know of people who've passed away in the condition of sujood. I'm sure you do as well, perhaps. I know of one Imam in Johannesburg who was delivering the Jumu'ah khutbah and between the khutbah, he dropped dead. Subhanallah. This wasn't a long time ago. He passed away. And I tell the youth always, look, that man passed away in sujood. This one passed away in tashahud. That one day passed away as he started salah. Do you even read your salah? 
so that that can be a probability. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Some people don't. They don't read the Salah, so there's no even chance of that happening. But at least if we do, there's a chance that, hey, you know, five times a day I'm reading Salah, so if I die, perhaps with a massive heart attack, whilst I'm standing, oh, what a blessed death. You know, we sit and look at people, other people, not our family, but other people, and we say, what a blessed death. Don't we say that? Go and tell them that. They'll tell you what you're talking about. A person passed. When they're old, they might agree with you. But you have a young person, someone lost their spouse in Salah. Initially, it's very hard to even admit that, okay, it was a blessed death. Because why? You're going to miss your spouse. Come on. Your child. The brother I told you lost his son 19 years old. You know what his wife told him? Very close people. His wife told him, if I heard it was you, it would have been slightly easier, slightly easier for me to digest it. You see the statement? Very close knit, which means someone who, someone who is older, we would think they would pass away. But when someone younger passes away, it's a bigger test. It's a major examination. Like I told you, here's your certificate. Do you know another thing that comes to my mind right now? All of us on the day of Qiyamah, we know we're going to be given the book of deeds, isn't it? Some in the right hand, some in the left hand. We all want our book of deeds in the right hand because the Quran says whoever is given it in the right hand, what will happen? Let's listen to one of the verses. There are many verses. Allah says, وَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَيَقُولُ هَا أُمُقْرَأُ كِتَابِيَهِ as for the one who is given his book in the right hand, he will say, hey, check my book, read it, read my book. Which means, ah, I got my book in my right hand. This is the day I can be happy, I can be whatever. Today I'm, mashallah, we are there. The true success is that day when you're given your book on the right. So what makes you get your book on your right? Deeds. What are big deeds? One of the biggest deeds is known as Ar-Ridha bil qada To be happy with decree. That's the biggest deed you can have. In the sense that you're, you're a mu'min and you have said, you know, look, you have, for example, Islam. Islam refers to the physical deeds that can be seen by others. Mainly, when they speak of it separately, what are the pillars of Islam? They'll tell you five. What are the five? They say, Shahadati Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. That's utterance of the statement. Agreed? Secondly, Salah, Zakah, Psalm, and Hajj. All of them I can see with my eyes. But whether there's belief in the heart, I don't know. Then they'll tell you, what are the pillars of Iman? Iman is one step higher than Islam. Why? Because Iman I cannot see. Only Allah knows whether you're a mu'min or not. So I believe in Allah. Do you? I don't know. You know and Allah knows. I believe in Allah. I believe in the messengers. I believe in the books. I believe in the angels. I believe in this. I believe in the life after death. I believe that good and bad is from Allah and Allah does good. Meaning whatever Allah has done is the best. And I believe we surrender to the decree of Allah. That's Iman. To believe that. Then there is something known as Al-Ihsan. Al-Ihsan is a step higher than Iman. What is it? Ihsan an ta'bud Allah ka anna ka tarahu fa illam takun tarahu fa innahu yarak. To worship Allah as though you can see Him. And if you cannot do that, then at least you should know He is watching you at all times. To worship Allah in a way that you are aware that He's watching you. That's Ihsan. Then you have something known as a rida bil qada. To be absolutely happy upon the decree of Allah. If you have that in your book by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His mercy, you may get your book on the right just because of that sabr and the, the happiness upon the decree, or should I say surrendering to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The world today teaches us that you must be upset. That's why we're upset sometimes. We watch people around us, they get angry. 
They start asking weird questions, meaning when I say weird questions, I mean, why did this happen? It shouldn't have happened to me. Who is, who does Allah think he is? A'udhu Billah. Sometimes initially people utter those words, not, not actually meaning to question, but just out of a certain insanity that crosses the head for a moment. It happens. It's just a point of uh, emotional threshold that is actually crossed, which makes you start saying things, which later on you actually accept that, hey, no, I shouldn't have said that. So if, if, if a person says it normally, and I know Muslimin do not say it defying Allah. They say it out of a certain threshold being crossed. So we got to calm down, calm them down as well. Hey, relax, take it easy. Don't say this. Just keep quiet. Or put a bit of something in your mouth. Just keep quiet. It's not easy to comfort people initially. You know, if something has happened fresh, it's not easy. Once time passes and lapses, it becomes a little bit easier. Sometimes people might say, well, it becomes more difficult. You need to understand. You go in there, you're going to meet them. It's not lost, as I've said for the third or fourth time now. It's not lost in every sense of the term. It's only lost in the sense of the dunya terms. That's all. Otherwise, it's that person, Allah chose them to be from our lineage. So Allah says, we'll unite you with them. We will unite you with them. Don't worry. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors. I hope what I've said has comforted yourselves and myself. And remember, to help one another, this support group, as soon as I heard about it, immediately in my mind I said, I am part of it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to help one another. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. And I said, even if it means I can't make it during a weekend, I will come even if it means a weekday, no matter what. And mashallah, here I am. And it, the honor is mine, to be honest with you. Because I'm speaking to people whom Allah has chosen to go through an examination that is of a very, very high level. Very high level. You know, you're talking to people who are chosen by Allah to go through part of what the messengers have gone through. Especially Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And he was known as the loved one. We know that. So here we are. You know, brothers and sisters, inshallah, if there is anything you'd like to ask, please feel free. And if there is anything you feel that you would like to share with us, please feel free. Uh, what we will do, inshallah, is we'll ask the brother to stop recording for a moment so that we can actually uh, be a little bit more relaxed in the speech. Maybe you can share with us something you can get off your chest a few items if you have to. I am one of you, a brother of yours in Islam. I am not here except, inshallah, for the pleasure of Allah, to fulfill a duty that is on my shoulders. And therefore, I look at all of you with a sense of love. Allah, I share your pain. And I understand what you've been through. Perhaps, I may not be able to feel it to that degree, but I know, and I'm here to tell you, Abshiru, glad tidings to you. Allah has chosen you. You can convert that whole feeling into a feeling of victory. If you keep on praising Allah, keep on praising, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, La ilaha illallah, Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. Keep on praising Allah, engage in that constant praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thank Him. I read a little bit of Qur'an, you know, do a good deed or two for those who've passed on. Doesn't have to be something big. <clears throat> Develop yourself as a mu'min and see, you know, dua, just to raise your hands, is the most powerful gift you can give a deceased. Did you know that? The most powerful, undebated, undisputed gift you can give is to raise your hand. And to say, Ya Allah, forgive them. Ya Allah, grant them a lofty place. Ya Allah, unite us with them in paradise. Ya Allah, you know, asking Allah. Because Allah is the greatest. He is the owner of that. So we ask Allah to open our doors. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah, bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma, bihamdihi, kashadu illa ilaha illa anta nastawfiruka wa natubu ilayka.